Hello everyone, I hope this finds you well. This is the last uh, video lecture dealing with the topic vertical positioning. Uh, we are going to explore realization of a vertical datum. The subjects covered uh, will be a discussion on tidal datum and gravimetric datum and we are going to finalize with a brief discussion about global height system. Just a reminder about references that we have on Desire to Learn. In this list that is presented, all papers have been mentioned before. Now this one is being referred to for the first time. It is on Desire to Learn and it is a very nice discussion about the geoid and the quasi-geoid. What is a vertical datum? A vertical datum is a surface used as reference for heights. This is the geoid. How we realize a vertical datum and ideally we want to use that with proper heights. This is a purely physical problem in nature. So we want to get the proper heights, either the dynamic height or the orthometric height. And by proper heights, uh, I mean heights based on actual gravity or physically meaningful heights. The term realization of a vertical datum or just vertical datum also refers to the use of a quasi-geoid as a reference surface. In this case we will be using the uh, normal heights even, even though the normal heights are not proper heights. They're not physically meaningful. The relationship that uh, we can establish uh, is given in here. We have the equation that we have seen before. The orthometric height is, are, is uh, it can be computed as a difference between the geodetic height and the geoidal height. If we're dealing with a normal height system, uh, these will be given by the difference between the geodetic heights and the height anomaly. We saw that the determination of values for the uh, dynamic height, the orthometric height, and the normal height can be accomplished from level heights applying the appropriate correction or if we use uh, if we can derive orthometric height directly from a geoidal map the whole question is how can a zero reference be realized for these heights so here we have the discussion between the two ways by means of a tidal datum or a gravimetric datum. This diagram shows schematically the whole idea. Our ultimate goal is to obtain orthometric heights. We can follow uh, two different paths. The first one is starting uh, is the tidal datum. It starts from a tidal station and the determination of the orthometric height of a benchmark nearby. And then the rest of the orthometric heights will be determined by means of geodetic leveling and gravity values. The other path is what we call the gravimetric datum. Uh, we start with a geoidal model and then the orthometric heights will be obtained by the 
measurement of geodetic heights and the application of geoidal heights from the geoidal model. We use as our vertical datum the geoid, which is a potential surface of the Earth's gravity field that most closely approximates mean sea level in a least square sense. Therefore, because it approximates mean sea level, the geoid is a time dependent surface. The best way to obtain heights is to start from the sea, from the seashore, where the geoid and quasi geoid coincide. The task of locating the vertical position of the vertical datum with respect to a benchmark is the determination of the position of the mean sea level. Now, mean sea level should be uh, it will be a function of the observing period and we work with a minimum of 18 years of continuous observations uh, to account for the different uh, tidal uh, contributions. The spatial coverage, I mean here, taking the orthometric height of the benchmark close to the tide gauge and propagating and, and uh, taking it into the, uh, the interior requires geodetic leveling and gravity measurements. Let us look for a scheme of a tide gauge in such a way to appreciate all the elements that are contained in the uh, establishment of, that, of a tidal datum. What we have in here are important elements, uh, the tide gauge itself, and uh, here I'm using a simple example of a float. There are other more modern ways of, uh, of uh, operating of a uh, tide gauge. Uh, but here let's have a look at, uh, at using a float. And we have the benchmark close by. So the, uh, there is this, uh, this uh, canal or, uh, that uh, let the water go from uh, the sea to the, um, to the tide gauge. And that uh, serves as a dynamical filter. It is nothing else but a, uh, a low pass filter because it's going to filter out the uh, short-term variations of the instantaneous sea level. Of course, this, the uh, sea level will vary uh, and after some time, uh, there is going to be the analysis of the tidal records and then the uh, position of the local mean sea level will be defined with respect to a zero mark of the tide gauge. So this would be what we call, this is what we call a conventional zero of the tide gauge. Therefore, we are establishing this height here. Uh, now this is what we measure, the instantaneous height of the instantaneous sea level. And after uh, analysis of tidal records, we have the height of the mean sea level. Now, the mean sea level is not necessarily the geoid. As we have seen before, the geoid and the mean sea level, they may have a vertical displacement that is known as the sea surface topography. So, which means that uh, we would have to uh, compute the sea surface topography at the, the tide gauge site. Having established the, uh, the value now of the, uh, our zero value, what we do is we can do a geodetic leveling uh, to determine the height difference between the benchmark 
uh, sorry, the benchmark is here and the tide gauge. The definition and realization of a tidal datum involve geodetic and oceanographic methods. To define eventually the sea level, uh, we need the tide gauges and we will have to determine the uh, sea surface topography, uh, which could be something uh, using satellite altimetry. There is a need for a global reference frame. Uh, the fact of life is that uh, we may have uh, local movements of the crust at the tide gauge site that will have to be monitored in such a way that uh, the uh, movement of the crust uh, do not get embedded in the tidal records. Now, a tidal datum, it serves the purpose of defining a, uh, a, 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 tide, uh, a tidal datum. So a tidal gauge uh, is good for defining tidal datums, but it is also uh, a tool for sea level monitoring. As we observe the tides over long period of times, we may start to see the variations of a sea level. We may see the rising or of the uh, of the sea. Uh, we may see a acceleration if that is the case. And uh, and uh, also we can look at all the records that uh, will give us a perspective about the uh, the past. So uh, paleo sea levels, and uh, we also have uh, different variations depending on the variations of, uh, of climate. For example, we have the Maunder minimum, which is a minimum in the uh, solar cycle that is associated with, with the Little Ice Age uh, that took place uh, around the uh, 1700s. And also we have the Milankovitch cycles, which are the big regulators of the ice ages. We said that mean sea level vary, but then what, what does cause it to vary? Uh, here a list of uh, reasons. Uh, that is what is known as eustasy, or the eustatic sea level, which is the change in global average sea level caused by an alteration of the volume of the world ocean. This alteration of the volume of the, of the world ocean may be caused by changes in water density or in the total mass of water. That is also uh, potentially crustal motions. Now the crustal motions will basically uh, masquerade mean sea level variations by means of an uplift or subsidence of the continental or oceanic crust. There are secular changes in oceanographic and other conditions, for example, temperature, salinity, and pressure, the oceanographic parameters. Also, variations in atmospheric pressure, sea current, river discharge, and glacial melt. One thing that is very important is that 
we must correct from sea surface topography. How do we determine sea surface topography? A reminder, sea surface topography has a, uh, another term which is used more often, particularly in the oceanographic arena, the dynamical ocean topography. So, methods, steric leveling. It's based on measured variations of seawater density with depth. That is satellite altimetry, as we discussed before, global dynamics, which are 3D time varying distributions of water velocity, and that is the method known as local response, which is essentially definition of sea level with respect to local parameters, such as atmospheric pressure, temperature, etc. Uh, these, uh, the textbook Venetiak and Krakivsky uh, discusses that a little bit on chapter 19.1. Now, let's talk about a gravimetric datum. The gravimetric datum is based on the geoidal model. So, uh, we, uh, the way to build that is we start with uh, data sets that will come from gravimetry, satellite altimetry, and satellite data, different types of satellite data, uh, they can be orbit perturbation, uh, they can be the acceleration uh, as uh, GRACE, the GRACE mission does, or gradiometry as the Goche mission used to do. A gravimetric datum is faster and cheaper to use. Uh, but this, this is a statement cheaper to use comes with a caveat because we have to discount the time and the cost for the collection of gravimetric data and the cost of satellites and the huge computational effort for the generation of a geoidal model. So it's not that cheap. A geoidal model can provide global coverage unlike tight gauges, which will be uh, basically depending on, on located, located on sites. Uh, but on the other hand, the Joida model is still discrete because it is computed as a grid. Therefore, a Joida model has restrictions in terms of spatial resolution. It is considered as being totally compatible with GNSS in the sense that we can obtain orthometric heights directly from geodetic heights everywhere in any territory. One big advantage of a gravimetric datum is that it can be used for the realization of any vertical system, being it local, regional, continental, or global. The problems associated with the gravimetric datum, though, uh, are there is a theoretical limit uh, in terms of, uh, of its uh, precision, one centimeter. In practice, it is difficult to assess its accuracy. We either have to use geoidal heights determined from tracking of GNSS over benchmarks or comparing a geoidal model with another geoidal model, usually those derived from geopotential models. Uh, the problem is that uh, in, these, uh, in the comparison between geoidal models, Results may show large differences 
than the internal precision of the geopotential model itself. Another problem is that a gravimetric datum depends on the choice of a normal gravity field, for example, the GRS-80 and associated reference ellipsoid, and also depends on an adopted value for W0. Okay, that's the, uh, the potential uh, on the geoid. Let us talk a bit about the global system of heights. This is uh, something that uh, is coming. Uh, we, we are very, very well familiar with the interaction, international terrestrial reference frames. Uh, these are 3D systems, but the height in the ITRFs are, of course, heights with respect to the uh, ellipsoid. They're not good for, uh, for height system. So a uh, effort is being made uh, already over the decades, uh, looking for a um, uh, realization of a global vertical system, which can only be done by means of a gravimetric system, a geoidal model. And uh, that system, that uh, global height system, would then be used to establish connections uh, with respect to regional vertical systems. And I'm using here the word regional because we typically uh, have uh, countries or continents establishing regional geoids. So in this figure, let's consider we have two continents. Okay, continent A, I'm calling region A, continent B, that's the region B. And uh, the vertical systems of these, uh, these regions, they have uh, at uh, a datum the um, tide gauges at uh, the point A and point B, O sub A and O sub B. Okay, we have the ocean there. And uh, in each side, that is, of course, its own system of heights. So looking at the left-hand side for this particular point A, uh, we have the uh, orthometric height of A uh, referred to, these, uh, to the tidal, tidal datum. We have the... Uh, geodetic height, uh, lowercase h, the term from Genesis. And we would have a regional geoid for this particular region. And the geoid of height, n, is represented there in red. Uh, similar situation for the right-hand side for this uh, region b. OK, in the figure, uh, we also we have, of course, the reference ellipsoid. And now we have this global geoid represented in green. So the global geoid, uh, if we want to determine the uh, height, the orthometric height, with respect to this global geoid, capital H, uh, we have to take into account the difference between the geoidal heights of the local, of the regional geoid, the regional uh, datum, and the global datum. And that's represented by the delta n. So how that is accomplished? Uh, we have to look the geometry and then write down a few simple equations. For region A, we can write that the difference between geodetic height and the orthometric height minus the geoidal height will correspond to this value of delta n. And the, uh, we have to realize here that uh, the uh, 
the N without subscript is the N of the global geoid. For region B, we have the same thing. We have the geodetic height minus the orthometric height of B minus the geoidal height, the global geoidal height, equals to minus delta N. Now, the, the, this negative sign is a consequence of the geometry. We can generalize uh, these expressions by saying that the geodetic height uh, minus the orthometric height of any generic point minus the global geodetic height at that particular point is going to be equal to delta n. So this delta n then becomes the quantity that will bring about the unification of height systems. All we have to do is apply this delta n to the orthometric heights of a particular regional height system to obtain the heights, the orthometric heights in this global height system. Now, the quantity delta n is a very interesting quantity because it comes from, uh, from the contribution of two terms, essentially. Uh, one term we can refer to as the global offset related to the difference between the W zeros. Now, what that would be? That would be the difference between the W0 adopted for the computation of the regional geoid and the W0 adopted for the computation of the global geoid. The other term would be a regional datum offset. As an example, I'm showing here a figure uh, obtained from BKG, that's the Mapping Agency of uh, Germany, which shows the offsets, that uh, computed offsets, that would have to be applied to each uh, country, to, each, to the vertical system of each country, in such a way that uh, the whole of Europe would be, uh, all the heights in Europe would be consistent with the European vertical reference frame of 2007. So we can see, for example, that uh, Great Britain would have to apply plus five, that should be millimeters, Germany plus one, uh, Italy minus 30, France minus 45 and so on and so forth. So after applying these, uh, the offset, then uh, all heights would be consistent uh, to these uh, EVRF 2007. So that's it. Uh, as a take home message, uh, we can say that we have, we can have access to orthometric heights either from a tidal datum or from a gravimetric datum. Both systems have advantages and disadvantages. For example, a tidal datum depends on the sea surface topography, whereas a gravimetric datum depends on the value, on adopted value of W0. And a global height system can only be realized by a gravimetric datum. So uh, until next time, take care.